It's fitting to be here at Carnegie Mellon to talk about behavioral economics. Um, uh, in, in some ways, it started here. Um, and so fittingly, I have a definition of behavioral economics that uh, was written by Herb Simon, uh, who was a legendary uh, professor here for many years. And he points out that uh, behavioral economics appears to be a pleonasm. Now, uh, not only was Simon smarter than all the rest of us, he also knew words <laughs> that uh, none of us know. If you know what that is, then you get an extra credit uh, in uh, Alex's course. Uh, <laughs> it, it, so uh, that word means a redundant phrase. And um, so he goes on to explain what he means by that, which is, well, why do we need the adjective? What other kind of economics could there be other than behavioral economics? Isn't economics supposed to be about the behavior of, we economists call them agents, but they're people, um, interacting in markets? That's what economics is. So. Um, and then he answers his own question, that uh, the answer to the question lies in the assumptions of uh, neoclassical economic theory, um, because, well, let me say what those are. So the core assumption, if you, if you had to say what's the one thing uh, that defines economics, it is that agents choose by optimizing. So if you're going to define e the economic approach in a few words, that's what it would be. Um, now, economics didn't always be like that. Um, for example, uh, Adam Smith, a uh, well-known economist, not generally thought of as a behavioral economist, wrote a big book. George actually read this book. So, here, here are just three passages from, uh, from Adam Smith, uh, one about overconfidence, uh, one of the things behavioral economists like to talk about, the overweening conceit which the greater part of men have of their own abilities, uh, loss aversion. Pain is, in almost all cases, a more pungent sensation than the opposite and correspondent pleasure. And self-control, uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, the pleasure uh, which we are to enjoy 10 years hence interests us so little in comparison to that which we may enjoy today. Now, uh, if you know, we made a top 10 list of behavioral economics principles, these three would be there. And here we have the person who's given credit for inventing economics. He already had it. So what happened? Uh, why did we need to reinvent the field? So it wasn't just Adam Smith. Um, I, I think economics was behavioral up through Keynes, uh, who was um, his magnum opus uh, was written in 1936. Um, I call him the inventor of behavioral finance. Uh, here's just uh, one passage. Um, the day-to-day -day fluctuations in the profits of existing investments, which are obviously of an ephemeral and non-significant character, tend to have an altogether excessive and even absurd influence on the market. Well, that sounds very true today. Um, and uh, one of our co-conspirators, uh, Robert Schiller at Yale, um, his path-breaking paper demonstrated exactly this fact, which was that prices, stock prices seem to fluctuate too much compared to um, what the theory said. Um, Here's an, another early behavioral economist, uh, Vilfredo Pareto, um, who said boldly 
the foundation of political economy and in general of every social science is evidently psychology. A day may come when we shall be able to decide the laws of social science derive the laws of social science from the principles of psychology. Now he's writing in, in 1906 when psychology barely existed. So he was doing a lot of projecting here. Um, but in some ways, um, that's exactly the program of research that uh, some of us have been uh, working on for the last four decades. Um, uh, finally, let's get to the University of Chicago view. Um, uh, many people have heard of John Bates Clark. The biggest prize the American Economics Association offers is called the John Bates Clark Medal. Um, this is a quote from his son, who was apparently a renegade member of the Chicago Economics Department. Um, why don't you just read that, because it's kind of long. Okay, so this is not only written by a Chicago economist, it was published in the House Journal, the Journal of Political Economy. And uh, so I've been saying for years that behavioral economics is just borrowing good psychology rather than inventing bad psychology. And that was the set out for us by uh, John Maurice Clark. So what are the defining assumptions of economics? Um, I, I'm going to list these four. I've already talked about optimization. So of all the things we can do, we pick the best one. Um, Self-interest, we care mostly about ourselves, possibly family members, uh, though not always those. Uh, and uh, we have very little regard for anyone else. Um, third, consumer sovereignty. This kind of follows uh, from optimization. Um, so people pick what's best for them. And uh, that implies, though economists never really say there are no self-control problems. They just do economics in a way that leaves that out. So if you say people always choose what's best for them, that means they don't have too many drinks ever, uh, that no one is obese, that everyone exercises just the right amount, that everyone saves the right amount for retirement, right? So. You, you won't find in an economics textbook the sentence, we assume people have no self-control problems, but that's implicit in, in the theory. And finally, unbiased beliefs. So uh, people are not supposed to be omniscient, but they're supposed to have uh, what are called rational expectations, which means that we have the same expectations that uh, a great econometrician like Linda Babcock would create in a model, and all that means is they're unbiased. Okay, so we all knew Trump was going to get elected. Um, now, those four assumptions, I mean, that's what Simon was talking about. It, it's those four assumptions that create the demand for uh, behavioral economics. And they describe homo economicus, the technical term for the people we study. Um, I just call them econs. And um, I say we should be studying humans instead of econs. Uh, now, the question is, do those assumptions apply to humans? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, now, let me start with a question about whether the idea that people optimize is even plausible. I mean, 
Could it possibly be true? And um, I would say no. And uh, why is that? Well, uh, some tasks are harder than others. So probably everybody in this room can play tic-tac-toe perfectly. Uh, I'm guessing no one in this room uh, thinks they could have won the big chess match that was being held this week. Uh, so we play easy games well, maybe close to optimally, and um, we don't uh, play chess. It, it, if, if we were econs, chess would be a solved game. And so either white would always win or black would always win or it would always be a draw. They were close to always being a draw, but um, so that's point one. Uh, point two, uh, people are different. So some people are smarter than others. Some people are better at some things than others. Uh, so assuming everyone is perfect at everything is an outrageous suggestion. Uh, so for example, and here I have a chart. I, sh I should say that I have a former student who makes fun of my PowerPoint slides and insists on improving them. And she added some editorial comments in the next two slides I'm going to show you. Uh, so here's a list of tasks that, uh, degree, that vary in their level of difficulty. Okay, so breathing, rock, paper, scissors, tic-tac-toe, checkers, chess, mortgage shopping, life cycle saving. Now, um, let's suppose we have somebody really smart, and since I'm at Carnegie Mellon, we'll uh, take Herb Simon. Um, now, he, he um, might be like this, equally good at all things, because if he couldn't chess well, he was good at writing programs to play chess well. So um, one way or the other, using his own intelligence or artificial intelligence, he would be a true econ. What about me? Well, here's, here's what my assistant thinks. Okay, now, uh, the same is so true for self-control. So here are a bunch of uh, self-control tasks. Okay, so uh, here we have Gandhi. Uh, amusingly, my, my assistant who made these slides married a guy called Gandhi, so her name is actually now Gandhi. But uh, so uh, now again, like Simon, he would be perfect at all of these, um, you know, having perf perfected self control. Um, what about me? Again, okay. So, um, now, this all seems kind of obvious. I mean, right? You're convinced. Um, so why was there a fight? And there was a fight uh, because there were what our friend Matthew Rabin uh, calls explainations, which is a great word, so I've stolen it from Matthew. And um, these are basically reasons why you needn't listen to people like us. And uh, George, who's been doing this almost as long as me, can tell you we've been hearing these arguments for uh, a long time. Uh, so one was coined by the great Chicago economist Milton Friedman and uh, it's uh, what, what we call the as-if defense. And the argument is, yeah, yeah, we know that people can't really uh, n 
do solve those equations. Not everyone in the economy has had two years of calculus, so they don't know how to solve for the life cycle saving solution, but um, they behave as if. And um, he tells this story about a billiard player, an expert billiard player, who plays as if he understood physics and geometry, and so forth. And so Friedman's argument was, don't worry about the assumptions being realistic. Let's just look and see whether the models make good predictions. And um, then we're off. Now, notice, I mean, Friedman was a brilliant debater, uh, probably the best economic debater of all time. And uh, he chose his examples carefully. Notice th this is an expert billiard player he, he chose. Um, if you've ever watched people playing pool in a bar, they don't play that way. <laughs> right? They aim at the ball they think is easiest to sink, miss often, and rarely think about what their next shot is going to be. So. Nothing like optimization. But notice economics is supposed to apply to everybody, not just experts, right? Economic theory is not meant to be a theory of the behavior of economists. It's meant to be a theory about everybody. And we're not all experts. Uh, furthermore, uh, the research of uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky um, to psychologists who uh, kind of followed in the footsteps of Herb Simon and made one huge intellectual leap from Simon. So Simon stressed that we are what he called boundedly rational. Bounded rationality was his term. And what uh, Kahneman and Tversky showed in a brilliant series of simple experiments is, yes, we make mistakes, and those mistakes are predictable. And that was a big move. Because it says, look, these errors don't just wash out. So our models are going to be systematically wrong because people make mistakes that are predictable. Uh, so, what do I conclude from this? The, the as-if argument, which held sway for most of the 20th century, and still holds sway in some buildings at the University of Chicago, um, was just a verbal sleight of hand. It, it really carries, should carry no weight. People are not, they don't behave as if they were maximizers. Uh, now, a second argument uh, came about because much of the early research in behavioral economics and the uh, research in psychology, uh, particularly Kahneman and Tversky, all of their questions were hypothetical questions. They, what they really were were thought experiments with subjects. And what I mean by that is, as soon as you saw it, you didn't really need to even see the data. Because you say, oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it, suppose I ask you, what's the ratio of um, gun homicides to gun suicides in the US? Uh, most people would say two to one. Three to one, it turns out there's about twice as many gun suicides as gun homicides. Uh, that's a predictable error. Then you say, well, why would that be? Well, we read more about homicides than suicides. Okay, now you don't need, you'll take my word for it about the data, right? You just see how that can happen. So, um, so uh, people, but economists say, oh, look. These are just parlor games. There's no stakes. 
Uh, we care about stakes. Um, now, a second argument I often heard is, uh, well, look, you guys study things, usually one shot. So you ask some question or you play some game once. In the real world, people get to learn. And so maybe they won't start out smart, but eventually they'll get really good at it, like playing a video game or something. Now, the first thing to notice is, although I would often hear these two arguments from the same person, they're mutually contradictory. And the reason is that the things that are the highest stakes, we do the least often. So um, think about buying milk, suits, cars, houses, getting married, saving for retirement. Right? We're going up the scale of stakes. Uh, milk, you might buy twice a week. Um, houses, maybe once a decade or two. Spouses. Most of us, not more than two or three times. <laughs> so uh, saving for retirement, barring reincarnation, you get one shot. right? So as we raise the stakes, the opportunities for learning go down. So you can't have both of these arguments. You've got to pick one. And um, uh, so another argument you know, if it ain't broke, um, you know, e economists, particularly before the financial crisis, used to say, look, our models are really good, uh, so why should we change? Um, and uh, my line about this has always been that economists are easy graders. Now, they might not be in the classes that you take, uh, but they are on themselves. And, uh, and the reason is that many things that, consti that economists call tests of economic theory amount to testing whether demand curves slope down. In other words, do people buy less of something if the price goes up? Well, yes, they do. And, uh, but Gary Becker wrote a paper that I think I personally made him regret that he ever wrote it, because I would bring it up frequently. Uh, he wrote a paper showing that if people choose at random, they have downward sloping demand curves. I'll leave the proof of that to you as a homework exercise. Um, but that's true. So. The fact that demand curves slope down tells us nothing about rationality. It just tells us that things are scarce. And if, you know, if rents around here double and your income is the same, you're not going to eat as well. And you'll live in smaller apartments. Uh, there are fewer tests of magnitudes, which would be really testing the theory. Very few. Uh, there's one main one I can think of. It's called the Equity Premium Puzzle, which was uh, a paper published in 1985 showing that the difference between returns on stocks and bonds is way too big to be consistent with the standard economic model. In fact, off by a factor of 10. But we hardly ever have tests like that. Instead, I mean, if we used the gr easy grading test, we'd say stocks are riskier than bonds, stocks have higher returns than bonds, victory. Right? But, you know, uh, let's push a little harder and say how much bigger. And the problem is the theory rarely is precise enough to give us a test. This, the, this particular model they test has the disadvantage of being testable. Um, so, you know, it doesn't seem like this is a particularly auspicious time for economists just to be declaring victory. Uh, then finally we come to something I rudely 
refer to as the invisible hand wave. <laughs> and um, uh, here's the way it goes and why I call it that. And I've, I've heard some version of this many times, as I'm sure many of my friends have. And it goes something like this. Well, yeah, in your experiments, people do something stupid. But if they're out in markets, then... Now, here's where the hand-waving comes in. It's my claim that no one has ever finished that phrase, keeping both hands in their pockets. I don't, it can't be done. Try it. Right? You, then what? You know, suppose that uh, George should have been a psychologist instead of an economist. Well, what's going to happen to him? Maybe he won't be as happy. He'll end up making more money. You know, it's not that he dies, right? If we buy the wrong car or the wrong house or we suppose we save too little for retirement, then we're going to be poor when we're old. Very few mistakes are fatal. And um, the, the markets just don't work this way. Um, there's no way markets have of transforming humans into econs. That's not the way markets work. Um, the important point is the, this, that it's much easier to make money exploiting a bias than eliminating it. In fact, it's hard to think of any examples of people getting rich by teaching people not to make some mistake. Whereas people make lots of money exploiting other people's mistakes. Extended warranties are my favorite pet example. Um, good rule of thumb, don't buy them. Uh, Matthew Rabin told me that he was offered an extended warranty on a memory stick that cost $10. Uh, you know, don't buy it. Um, there's a great Simpsons episode that you can s look up that makes this point. So, okay, wh what have we concluded so far? The explainations are not a big setback. Uh, we have better one-liners than they do. So, uh, what should we do? We should take the data seriously. And um, it, it's fine to start with unrealistic models, but then let's throw data at them and see what happens. Um, as for the role of stakes, that's an empirical question. Do m people make better decisions as the stakes go up? We think people are really good at saving for retirement, uh, getting married, which is a 50-50 proposition. Um, so here's uh, one way um, I investigated this. Um, there's lots of studies showing that people are not as big of jerks as economists give them discredit for. And uh, you probably all know uh, the Prisoner's Dilemma game, and uh, um, you know that the Nash equilibrium in that game is for both people to defect. If you run an experiment, about 40 to 50 percent of people cooperate. Now, there have been thousands of these experiments run. First with zero stakes, then with low stakes, then with slightly bigger stakes. So um, some colleagues of mine and I had a chance to study this at really big stakes. And we did it by using a game show. 
And uh, it has the tantalizing title, Golden Balls. <laughs> I didn't come up with that title. Um, so uh, this was a Brit game show that started out with four people but narrowed down to two. And at the end, they play a prisoner's dilemma, uh, technically a weak prisoner's dilemma, uh, worked, which wor worked as follows. Uh, they had made some money, and they could split or steal. If they both split, they each got half. If one steals, the other splits. The stealer gets everything. If they both steal, they both get nothing. Okay? So, uh, what happens? Uh, if, if we had run this experiment, it would have cost us 2.6 billion pounds, which is like a trillion dollars. So, uh, uh, well, not, a, not anymore, but, um, but in, in the individual shows, the stakes ranged from a low of 100 pounds to a high of 100,000 pounds. There are a few of these you can find on YouTube. Um, the 100,000 plus one is very much worth watching, and there's another one you can find where a guy uses a very interesting strategy that I won't spoil, but you can kill some time on that tonight. Um, so, here's the question. As we raise the stakes to really big, what happens to cooperation rates? Do they fall to zero? As economists have been arguing without any data for 50 years. And the answer is sort of. So here's the data. And here's what I mean by sort of. Uh, the cooperation rates do fall, but they fall to the same level that we see in lab experiments for a dollar, 40 or 50%. Right? You can see th this is like uh, 1,000 pounds and up we're getting 40 to 50% cooperation rates. You know, the curve only goes down because they cooperate even more when we're playing for low stakes, meaning 100 pounds or 250 pounds. I call this the big peanuts phenomena, uh, meaning that if you're on this show and you think, the, I, think I think the average was about five, 10,000 pounds. So you go in there thinking you're going to be playing for a big pot. And you only are playing for 200 pounds. So, ah, that's peanuts. Now, of course, if we were running lab experiments with 200 pound stakes, we would not think that's peanuts. But in this context, it's peanuts. And people say, well, why be a jerk on national television uh, for 100 pounds? Um, but uh, otherwise, uh, there's just no evidence that um, uh, raising the stakes uh, changes it. Um, well, all right, let's raise the stakes further. I started doing research in finance. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, precisely to answer this question. I figured let's go to the market where there's the biggest stakes and study that. Now, uh, there's something called the efficient market hypothesis, which was invented by one of my Chicago colleagues and golf buddies, Gene Fama, and it has two components. I call them the no free lunch component and the price is right component. No free lunch means you can't beat the market. That's the one that Gene cares the most about. The price is right component is the one that I think is more important, which is not only you can't beat the market, but prices are fair measures of intrinsic value. 
So whatever the market value of Apple is right now, um, that is the true price of Apple. Now, for a long time, uh, financial economists had lived in the comfort of thinking that this part of the theory was untestable. And there's nothing better in a theory than untestability. Um, but uh, it turns out if you can find some little situations where you can test this, and I'm going to just show you one. There are, there are many, but this one is amusing. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm, I've said this. So, there's a closed end mutual fund. Let me s stop for a second and say what a closed end mutual fund is. Uh, most mutual funds, the ones you're used to, are called open end funds. Open end means they're open to new business. So if you send Vanguard $1,000 and say you want to buy the S&P 500 index fund, they buy that amount of stock. A year later, you say you want to sell it, then uh, they'll sell that many shares and give you back your money. Um, all trades are done at what's called net asset value, meaning the prices of the securities that they've been holding for you. A closed-end fund runs differently. The organizers raise some money, let's say $100 million, and then they sell shares in the fund, and the shares trade. And the interesting thing, uh, and I've written a couple papers about these, is that these funds don't always trade for the value of the securities they own, which is weird. Because the, the securities they own is public. So if I want to buy the stuff they own and the price is different, then I just buy whichever one is cheaper. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk about a specific one of these. It's called the Cuba Fund. And um, it, has, it has the ticker symbol, C-U-B-A, but of course it has never invested in Cuba. A, that would be illegal. B, there are no securities. Okay? So two pretty big problems uh, investing in Cuba. Now, um, historically, this fund, like most closed-end funds, traded at a discount, meaning you could buy $100 worth of their assets for $85, which is a good deal. Uh, now, I'm going to show you a plot. The orange line is net asset value, what the shares are worth. You can see it's kind of flat during this period. Then you notice there's some funny thing going on there where all of a sudden the price of the fund goes to a 70% premium, which means you'd have to pay $170 to get $100 worth of assets. Anybody have any idea what caused that? I can tell you that, oh, I don't have the year here. Uh, yeah, no, it's 2014. So, um, yeah, any guesses? Yes. When President Obama announced opening of markets there. Exactly. So, President Obama announces his intention to ease relations with Cuba, <laughs> keeping in mind that this fund doesn't own anything in Cuba. <laughs> but, the shares jump to a 70% premium and stay there for months. It took uh, almost a year for it to go away. Really? Efficient markets? 
do it. I showed this to Gene once. He was annoyed. <laughs> now, here's uh, uh, something that just happened. Here, here's a. Oops. Here's this plot now updated to last week. You see this? Well, first of all, notice it's been selling at a discount, so things sort of settled back down to normal. Uh, what happened last week? Fidel died. Fidel died. <laughs> right? Now, A, how old was he? 90. 90, right? And he was <laughs> barely alive <laughs> for the last few years. If people had rational expectations, they would have thought he was going to go any day. His brother is running the company, not him, the, com the country. <laughs> so it's really hard to see why Fidel dying, A, wasn't discounted into the prices, and B, again, why should it... Okay, so, so it, it turns out, you know, this one's just amusing. There are less funny ones uh, that illustrate the same point. Now, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say that after o Obama's announcement, there was a bubble in the uh, price of the Cuba fund. Because if you really want to buy those stocks, like I say, you can go buy them. They have, uh, like the Carnival Cruise Line, I think, is their biggest holding. Go buy that, you know. Um, <coughs> and... Nothing happened to net asset value. Same with Fidel. It's not like the price of the shares went up. It's just, uh, I mean, the price of the assets, just the price of the shares. Um, okay, well, what about other cases? Um, th this is a plot of uh, the real estate bubble. Now, um, you can see, if we go back to 1960, uh, the dark line is um, uh, prices, and the lighter line is 20 times rent. And what you can see is real estate prices more or less track rental prices, which is kind of what you'd expect, right? Because you can buy or you can rent. So, and that was true right up until about here, where something weird happened. And the dark, the lighter line up there is a better measure of security prices that comes from uh, the Case-Shiller Index that uh, Bob Schiller helped create. And uh, so that's probably a more accurate measure, but either way, Sure looks to me like prices went up and then prices went down and, uh, and that you could tell that at the time. You can't tell when it's going to end. That's the unfortunate part. So uh, Fisher Black, famous financial economist who invented the Black-Scholes formula, uh, said that he thought prices were efficient, meaning they were right within a factor of two. Um, I, I think if he had lived long enough, he would have realized that to three. Um, but uh, many important people have acted as if prices are always right, and including Alan Greenspan, who was warned by Bob Schiller that prices were getting irrationally exuberant uh, and gave a famous speech where he uttered that phrase, giving Bob a good book title. Uh, but then he said, nah. Um, so, you know, I think price equals intrinsic value is a perfectly fine hypothesis. The only problem is, comes, is if you believe it. Now, uh, 
that, so we can test this in financial markets, which is the attraction of going there. But then suppose we try and think about other markets. Um, so what about labor markets? So do people get paid their worth? So according to economics, people get paid the value of their marginal product, meaning what you produce. The value of what you produce equals what you get paid. Now, you know, the dean can tell you that means that what economists are teaching is obviously much more valuable than what philosophers are teaching, for example, according to that theory. There you go. That's why you had to become a dean. <laughs> one for Thaler. Okay. <laughs> you know, you walked right into that one, you know. So um, lots of, you know, lots of people have been talking about the fact that we have rising inequality. It's not a recent phenomenon. It's been going on at least since 1990, and pretty smoothly. You can't blame it on any one president. It started, uh, it was certainly going on in the Clinton administration and in the George W. Bush administration and in the Obama administration, and the rich are just getting richer and everybody else is staying flat. And that's true both in income and wealth. Um, now, if you read a lot of the discussions about this, the argument is, well, that's because the lower paid part of the population has become less productive. Or the ones that are making all the money investment bankers and plastic surgeons are doing something that's more and more valuable than it ever was. Um, now, what if that's wrong? It wasn't true for financial markets where we have arbitrage helping us set prices. Should we really be sure that it's true in labor markets? Um, what about rents? What about luck? I happened to go into the only kind of economics that I was any good at doing. Linda can attest to that, having written papers with me. So uh, that was luck. You know, suppose I had decided to become an econometrician. Mm, no. <laughs> so, so that was luck. Um, so here's a long standing puzzle, which is there are big differences across industries in what clerical workers get paid. So if you're an administrative assistant, you make a lot more if you work at Goldman Sachs than if you, do, if you work at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so David Card, has done some interesting work on this um, in Germany. And let me just show you one chart. Here's the, there are a lot of lines here, but the only ones you really have to pay attention to are the red and yellow bold ones. So here's the idea of this study. He looks at individual workers that switch from a low paid industry to a high paid industry vice versa. And so uh, econometricians would call this individual fixed effects, meaning we're studying the same person. So you could say in my example of the administrative assistant, well maybe Goldman just gets better administrative assistants, and that explains it. Well, here we're holding the people constant. And what do you see? If you're a lucky yellow guy, that moves to uh, uh, that moves from one up to four, your income goes way up. 
if you're an unlucky red guy and you get down to a low paid industry, uh, your pay goes down. Now that doesn't sound to me like a story about productivity. And if that's right, then I think we have to rethink the whole inequality debate. Now, there's a part of that debate that's right. It's clear we have to work on education and giving people tools. I'm not disagreeing with that. But uh, if we're asking whether the people who are making the most, like the people who are getting cabinet positions, um, do they deserve it? Um, here's just an interesting graph of uh, the ratio of CEO pay to uh, typical worker pay from 1980 to, and you can see it's gone up like a thousand percent. Um, it's, no, it's going up 90, by a factor of 100, sorry. So uh, have CEOs really gotten that much better? I don't know. I, I can't prove it like the Cuba Fund, right? I did the Cuba Fund because nobody's going to say that was rational. Here I've got colleagues who will tell me this is all uh, because CEOs have gotten so much more productive, but uh, I don't know. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, there's no way to sell a CEO or even a department chair or dean short. Um, so one last phrase I want to introduce, um, uh, supposedly irrelevant factors. E economists often have, I told you that there aren't that many predictions about magnitudes uh, because the parameters usually aren't specified. We just say demand curve sloped down, but we don't, the theory doesn't tell us whether it's steep or flat. Uh, but economists have very precise predictions about some variables, and the precise prediction is they won't matter at all. Okay? And these are the things that I call supposedly irrelevant factors. Um, so here's a, a few of them that research has shown do matter, sunk costs, economic theory says you should ignore sunk costs. Uh, humans pay a lot of attention to sunk costs. The way a problem is worded, some of Kahneman Tversky's most stunning demonstrations were about that. If you describe a problem in terms of lives saved, then you get a different answer than if you describe it in terms of lives lost. It should, no, there's no definition of rationality that allows the answer to depend on the wording. It, it's like if I asked you the same question in two languages that you understand, do you like chocolate or coffee ice cream better? You should give the same answer in Spanish and English, right? That's, but that's what we, what we violate. Um, which options are designated as the default shouldn't matter. When uh, on United Airlines, which I flew here this morning, some of the planes have uh, TV, direct TV, and it's set to CNBC. That's the default. So you see Jim Cramer screaming at you on the screen unless you switch it. And if you walk up and down the aisle, three quarters of the TVs are on that, which isn't very much fun to watch with the sound off or on. Um, so, uh, so these are 
what I call supposedly irrelevant factors. They can matter a lot. Uh, here's an example. Now, the standard economic theory of savings says people save the right amount. Right? They optimize. So they figure out how much they're going to make over their lifetime, what's the optimal consumption path, how much do you want to leave to consume when you're old, how much do you want to consume now, what rate of return you're going to get on your investments, and then you optimize. Uh, people aren't very, do, very good at that. Now, uh, suppose we change the default option about how much you're saving in a retirement plan, or whether the default is that you're in or out. So in traditional 401k plans, the, in order to join, you have to fill out a bunch of forms. People don't like forms. So uh, the idea propped up. Uh, maybe we should just change the default, give people a pile of forms, and the top one says, if you don't fill out this pile of forms, you're going to be put into the savings plan at this saving rate in this fund, but you can opt out or switch it to something else. Now, according to economic theory, this should have no effect. Most of these plans come with a company match. It's worth thousands of dollars to people to be in this plan. Filling out a form might be a pain, but it shouldn't matter. Does it matter? Yes. George, notice those red lines, how they're all around 90%. So if you automatically enroll people into 401k plans, about 90% of people join. If you don't, you get the blue lines. Uh, and notice, this has a huge effect on low-income workers. For low-income workers, a little over 20% are joining if they have to fill out the form. Uh, sorry, it's only 87% for um, uh, the poor. Uh, but even rich guys are lazy. Um, if you do it by age, uh, again, you get a chart that looks very much the same. So this is a supposedly irrelevant factor that matters uh, hugely. Now, there's a problem with automatic enrollment, which is most firms default people into too low of a savings rate namely 3%. Now, I'll tell you the story about how that happened. It's an accident. When automatic enrollment, when the idea first was created, and a couple companies had tried it, and uh, Bridget Madry, an economist who was then at Chicago and now at Harvard, uh, wrote a paper about it, um, we wanted companies to try this, but they were afraid that it wasn't legal. So I asked a friend who was in the Treasury Department in the Clinton administration whether he could write what's called an advisory letter saying it's okay to do this. So he wrote such a letter. And the tradition in those letters is to give an example. <laughs> All right, you can see where this is going. So in the example, he said, suppose there's a firm that automatically enrolls people at a 3% saving rate. The rest is history. Now, this is almost 20 years ago. I give a talk to 500 plan sponsors, meaning companies who run pension plans. And I asked, how many of you use automatic enrollment? Most. How many of you have 3% as your default saving rate? Most. And then I told them this story, and that there was a lot of embarrassment. <laughs> so uh, how can we cure that? Uh, well, a uh, former student of mine, Shlomo Benarzi, and I came up with a solution we call Save More Tomorrow. 
Uh, and the idea is we all have more self-control in the future. <laughs> right? Many, many of us are planning diets like after New Year's. <laughs> right? Not tonight. Uh, so the idea was we would go to people and say, would you like to save more later? Oh, later. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so... Uh, in the, in the first experiment we ran, uh, they were offered advice, and uh, this option was only given to people who declined the advice to increase their saving by five percentage points. So these were very reluctant savers. Here's what happened. You can just look at this column. Uh, uh, no, this is horizontal. I'm used to, uh, Look at this one. So these are the people who opted into this program, you can see they were pitiful savers, saving only 3.5%. Um, and when we capped them out, um, they were at 13.6%. So we know how to get people to save. This is a solved problem. We just have to convince companies to use automatic enrollment and generic version of this is now called automatic escalation. Um, not all companies are doing it. M more than half of big companies are, but uh, the big problem is with smaller companies and, and half of Americans don't work at a place that doesn't have a retirement plan. Um, now, a response I often got from economists is, well, maybe, yeah, you're tricking them into putting money over here, but then they're just running up their credit card. And uh, we were worried about that. I'm going to stop in a minute, don't worry. Um, but we had no way of testing that because there was no U.S. data set that had complete balance sheets. But uh, there's a young economist named Raj Chetty who writes a great paper once a month and annoys the rest of us greatly. Um, and with a group of Danish collaborators, he was able to study this in Denmark where they have data on wealth. So they have your total balance sheet. And let me just show you a couple pictures. So these are workers who switch companies to a plan that has a higher default saving rate. And you can see uh, they're passive. Uh, but what happens to the rest of their saving? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. All right. I'm going to, I want to quit. So I'm going to go to the, Oh, this is too good not to. Uh, I've always had this theory that when people do their tax returns, they do a tax return, they do a first draft, then they see whether they owe money. And if they owe money, they get creative. So um, that's what happens apparently in Sweden. There's some deduction you can take that's bogus, kind of like a home office. And, um, and so here's the percentage of people who take this bogus deduction as a function of whether they would owe money or not. Okay? So, all right. Uh, all right, here's, I'm going to the, so the, what's the basic problem? We're using one theory for two tasks. We have a theory that tells us what the smart thing to do is, and then we use that same theory to say what happens. We need two different kinds of theories. And really, behavioral economics is all about developing that second kind of theory. We don't want to throw away the first one. In fact, we couldn't do the second one without the first one. Um, OK. so. Uh, I'm looking for my last slide. 
here's a slide of making everybody happy. I'm going to skip. So, um, so uh, what do I, as the talk was past, present, future. Future is one slide. Um, I say, I advocate what I call evidence-based economics, which is another rude term, um, because you could ask what other kind of economics could there be? Um, but there, yeah, there could be axiom-based economics. Um, so if everyone adopts that, then uh, I think that this new department will disappear. Um, and the reason it'll disappear is that it'll be the only economics department because all of economics will be as behavioral as it should be. And I think that's all I have to say.